Now I suspect that with this one they were trying to make an Apatosaurus that's in the middle of a fight and it's rearing on its hind limbs so that it can fight, which we'll have plenty of time to talk about Apatosaurus in the future, where if it were fighting it would be using its tail, not its, you know, front limbs and its mouth. But uh, they've given it these short little front legs and they've given it primitive feet and hands with, with five toes each. So. I'm thinking it's supposed to be a prosauropod. And yes, I said the word prosauropod. There's a few people that will take issue with this, but uh, in the context of this episode, I mean it to mean any sauropodomorph that is not a true sauropod. I think we're supposed to call them platyosauria now, but I, I'm, I'm not really sure where we're standing on the whole cladistics as far as sauropodomorphs go. So, if we can see that it is a prosauropod, then we apply the stock dinosaurs trope and assume that any toy that's, that's in existence that, you know, would come in a box of dinosaurs from China would be one of the ones discovered between, like, 1850 and 1920. Which means this really could only be three different creatures. You've got Anchisaurus, uh, which I don't think this is because Anchisaurus was tiny and really lightly built. Uh, you've got Massospondylus which is one of the ones that Richard Owen described himself, so we've known about that one for quite a while. Uh, that was from South Africa, and it was about the size of a horse. This appears to be more heavy set than that, uh, so that leaves Platyosaurus, which could be the size of a horse, but could grow to the size of a rhinoceros, because there was a lot of uh, plasticity developmentally with that dinosaur. So. I'm gonna go with Platyosaurus on the grounds that we're gonna be talking plenty about, you know, American dinosaurs or British Empire dinosaurs, but Platyosaurus was described by von Meyer, and that's Germany, and it was found in, in South Germany, so yeah, globalism. I guess we'll start with the head. The height of the head is, is uh, pretty good, but Platyosaurus would have had really long, light skull, and it would have been, in profile, rather boxy, like pretty straight out until you get to the, the front edge of the antorbital fenestra, the hole in front of the eyes that all archosaurs had, except modern crocodiles, which shut up. Uh, then the nose was, was sort of a tilted down looking dorky thing. Uh, they have the nostrils facing forward, so those should be off to the sides a little. And then, uh, Teeth were probably okay. That's sort of a level of detail thing. It's not really, like, these are, these are clearly not carnivore teeth at least, so I'm going to say okay. It would have had a lot of tiny teeth, uh, um, similar to a modern iguana, or an extinct iguanodon. Uh, jaw were probably good as well. It's, it's got a little bit of the, uh, you know, aside from the, oh, it's not the right length, uh, in proportion to the top jaw, it would have had a little bit of an underbite, and, and there was sort of a downward curve to the lower jaw, at least just in the specimens I've seen. Neck length is not bad. Uh, you at least have it, you know, going into the back of the head the way that it's supposed to go, instead of at a 90 degree angle, which you see a lot. Um, sauropodomorph neck posture is another thing that paleontologists keep going back and forth on. As far as I know, where we're currently standing is, when in doubt, it held its head high. So let's have the, I know this is rearing up to pretend that it's in a fight, but have the angle between the neck and the back be sharper and give it a little bit of an S-curve. Moving into the back, the, I don't mention the, the shape of the body very often, but this one is really good. Like it's, it's got a, uh, tall oval cross-section. You see a lot of dinosaurs reconstructed with a flat oval or a, or a sort of a lizard sloped thing going on, but they were vertical creatures and they, they carried themselves upright. And, and Good job, toy maker, on that front. Um, I really think it should be parallel to the ground. Rule of thumb for Saurischians, back was parallel to the ground. Saurischians from the Greek, I keep doing that. Since I said Sauruskian, uh, which means lizard hip, let's talk about the hip. It did have a lizard-like hip. Uh, this would have been short in profile, and it wouldn't have had a lot of the uh, spinal processes like what we saw on the uh, Stegosaurus last episode. 
Uh, they've tilted it back, though, which you see a lot in the toys because they want to make them drag their tails. Uh, this was really common for the early half of the 20th century with the reconstructions. Hey, let's just take the hip and bend it back so that the tail drags on the, on the ground. No, lift the hip up, straighten the legs, have the tail off the ground. Speaking of the tail, it's tiny and sort of rat-like. It, it should be bigger at the base and just continue slight S-curve to straight out. Just balancing the creature. The center of mass would be over the back legs uh, because it was a biped. And it's really, they, they've got it like swirled around and you'd see that kind of flexibility like at the very tip of a Diplodocid's tail. Like, well, Diplodocus, obviously, but also Apatosaurus or what have you, uh, when they wanted to whip them around, there's a theory that that was for communication. Not that much flexibility for a prosauropod tail. And I'm aware of the problems that are presented when you try and design a, a bipedal toy that isn't a human that you need to stand up. And it's much easier to make, you know, a scaly kangaroo so that it can sit on its tail. But we're here to talk about how to make it accurate, not how to make it... Uh, feasible from an engineering perspective. We're going to talk about the limbs, and some people have been sort of looking at me funny because I keep saying that it was a prosauropod and it was a biped. Uh, you see a lot of reconstructions where they're quadrupeds, but the most recent stuff that I've seen is they were actually bipeds because the front limbs uh, were not able to pronate, which is where they, they would naturally be like this, but in this reconstruction, and in a lot of reconstructions that would assume quadru quadrupedal locomotion, they would be like this. And it couldn't do this. It couldn't turn its hands towards its back legs. The front arms are really why I wanted to talk about Platyosaurus in the first place. If you go up to somebody and say dinosaur, there are really two images, unless they think of a velociraptor, there's really two images that they're going to think of. There's either going to be the brontosaurus with the, you know, the long neck and tail and just sort of stomping along, or it's going to be Tyrannosaurus rex, with its stubby little front arms that are the butt of so many jokes. Here come the prosauropods that look like somebody just took a small sauropod and stuck giant theropod arms onto it. And it's sort of a which way to the gun show sort of situation going on, except that they couldn't actually do the associated gesture because they couldn't pronate their arms. So, to make this accurate, let's turn the arms like so and really make them beefier. Like, the shoulders should be broader and the wrists should be wider. Now, as far as the hands go, uh, this is one of the few that I've seen with an actual accurate number of fingers, but they're all the same size. Like, neither of these hands particularly looks like it could go up to a Lillian Sternus and just smack it and cleave its skull open. And I realize that there's a theory that Platyosaurus's claws were used to manipulate plant matter, but that's boring. So, the uh, first finger, which would be the same as your thumb, it would be analogous to your thumb is what I should say, would be short uh, and have a pretty long claw on it. And then the next two fingers would be long, but with slightly smaller claws. And then the last two fingers were not vestigial, but were very small. Uh, I'm not sure what they were used for offhand, but, heh, offhand. But they were small and, and, and there. Gonna avoid making puns like that. Back legs, not bad as far as length and, and ratios go, but should be straight again to carry the animal so that it's, you know, off the ground. Not sitting on its tail. Uh, the feet, the, the middle three toes would be the big ones. The, the, the middle three toes sort of looked like a sauro, a, sauropod, a theropod foot. Theropods were also sauroskian, but, but different lineage. Um, the innermost toe would have been smaller. It would, be, it would have touched the ground, but it would have been smaller than the middle three. And the outermost toe was just a dew claw. It's walking on its heels like a human when it really should be walking on its toes like a dog. The term is uh, digitigrade. It's called digitigrade, digitigrade because it's on its digits instead of plantigrade. So you might notice that I haven't mentioned anything about scale. That's because in proportion to the arms, the hands aren't bad, and in proportion to the legs, the feet aren't bad. It had rather t 
tiny, delicate little feet for an animal this size. And this was late Triassic, so this was kind of the biggest dinosaur that had showed up on the scene that we know of. You know, size of a rhinoceros was pretty big at the time. Uh, I've, I've seen an interesting theory that says because it had such tiny feet and such a large mass, that's why we have so many skeletons. So many skeletons specifically from the area of Pangaea that would later become Swabia in Germany. They theorized that it was a swamp and that small creatures like juvenile Platyosaurus and, and you know, little theropods could run across the swamp just fine. But Platyosaurus had all of that bulk centered on these two little points and it sunk into the mud and drowned. And that would explain why we have so many of those skeletons and so many adult skeletons. We have very few, if any, sub-adult platyosaurs. So the feet are important to paleontology and to humans' understanding of our past. And that's why they should be accurate. I believe that is everything I wanted to say about platyosaurus. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please like, comment, and subscribe. You could even recommend dinosaurs for me to take apart. You could even mail me a dinosaur. Uh, we might put our address in the description, and you probably won't get your dinosaur back if you do mail it to me, though. You can even go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can become a member and donate, and we'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon. It was upside down. I set it down like this. I will point out that in our games of catch, I did manage to get my father to say, Oh, Stephen, where did I go wrong?